Uh, but we're going to be talking about the life and path of the truther, the Christian truther. <clears throat> and uh, this really jumped out at me when I saw this, because this puts a lot of what we do, we look at as truthers in perspective. It says, anyone who studies Illuminati, the Vatican, Catholic Church, Jesuits, Federal Reserve, Freemasonry, elite globalists, Zionism, New World Order, Hollywood, all of it, anyone who goes really deep finds God. At the bottom of the, of the rabbit hole is God. And a war against God. The Book of Life and Christ, it's all about him. It's a war against him. I was, I was talking to uh, JC yesterday, and I mentioned that the soda machines, Coke just released these new soda machines where you can print a message on your Coke can before it comes out. <laughs> Except Jesus. You, you could put Buddha or Satan loves you on there, but you can't put Jesus. You get an error message. And whenever I see things like that, it always boosts my faith. When you see the system hating Jesus, it just lets you know you're on the right path. Isn't that right, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I want to just go into these ideas around being a Christian truther because all of us have experienced the sting of finding out NASA's fake and 9-11 was fake and then having loved ones in our center of influence, in our immediate circles that didn't, and there's a lot of dead bodies behind us because <clears throat> you know being a christian is one thing and then being a truther is another thing but being a christian truther <laughs> is altogether another thing so you know the it's one thing to go and and i remember when i got born again i had two very close friends one of them was rob paul i have pictures of me and rob paul in diapers so now we're in our 20s and and you know i'm a friend of this guy since birth and i get born again and immediately i realize we're in two different worlds and i i, I mean these guys are either going to come up where i am or i'm going to go back down where they are and i'm not going back down and i'm sure if you've been born again <laughs> you've had a similar experience where there was uh, a realization that the people that you used to run with are not going to it's not copacetic, right? Have you guys experienced that when you got saved? Yeah. Well, guess what? The same thing happens when you become a truther as a Christian. You suddenly go through this immediate overnight metamorphosis, and the people in your center of influence don't, and you have the, almost the exact same kind of experience. Have you guys had firsthand experiences with, with that? It's like being born again again. Yeah. yeah. Again, because I became a truther first. And I gradually, it was sort of the uh, becoming a truther made me halfway alienated from the people around me. And then becoming a Christian made me all the way alienated <laughs> from the people I had normally associated with. Um, but for me, it was sort of a search for the truth and it, it was sort of a natural outcome of researching various conspiracies mm -hmm. once i realized that how this world really works and the people in control all appear to worship lucifer i had to go back and reevaluate why i had fallen away and what do i really believe and that's what led to me becoming a christian again Mm. Sorry, I was just uh, removing somebody from the uh, live stream. Jesus Warrior 12 is using all kinds of foul, disgusting language. So let me just, let me just, uh, oh, I already booed him for five minutes. So he'll be back, but we'll, we'll Jesus Warrior, you're going to have to, Cool it, or else we're going to have you send to the exit door. Um, so this, this journey is just filled with obstacles. That's what the word narrow road means. Jesus said the gate is big and the 
the way is narrow. That word narrow means filled with obstacles. And that's what being a tr Christian truther becomes. So, you know, if you love being rejected, ignored, misunderstood, disrespected, and even being hated, you know, be sure to become a Christian truther. It's a great way to be hated because most Christians are really not truthers. Uh, what I've found, if you go into most churches, you're going to be alone. Which is real. Why is that? I don't understand what is going on with people. You'd think that Christians would be the most, you know, discerning. Right? You know, I, I have a, an emerging perspective, like an emerging worldview with regard to this. And it, I really am starting to believe that God's people are just, they're hidden. You know, I've talked about the scripture so many times that all of creation groans for the unveiling of the, of the sons of God. And if it were really that easy that the devil could just go into all the churches and pick off the Christians one by one, he'd be able to focus all his energy, but it just <laughs> doesn't work that way. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's been really consistent with my walk because it's a little different than yours, John. I don't know you quite as well, JC, but I think in the people in my life, I've become like, novelty crazy uncle and you know to them i am so far out there that it's almost like they don't even pay me any mind and i'm, I'm hidden um i think anybody ever see schindler's list yeah you know, so in the movie at the end when he purchased all the soldiers i'm not saying this is true or anything i'm just going with 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 the concept mm -hmm. the guy the enemy there played by ralph fiennes he said to him, I know that you wouldn't be doing this unless you were getting something out of it and making a lot of money out of it. And I think that's how our walk often goes. Oftentimes the enemy will, they'll underestimate, they'll think we're a lot more selfish or, or self-motivated than we really are. And, and sometimes that's the way to get things done. Because what is the what is the really the chief complaint among most that are non Christians <laughs> is that we're self righteous. We think that we're better than other people. Yeah. Isn't that kind of a legitimate complaint when it comes to some of the people in the five hundred one c three churches? Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, but it's it's so weird because searing logic doesn't seem to apply to the normie, the people that are in, Christians that are still in the matrix. Facts. Searing logic, it, it's irrelevant. They don't, they don't have any place for those things. Uh, it's like an a priori argument. You come to the table and you already have your position. It's like scientism. Scientism will try to put you back in your box by saying the science is already proven. Well, science is, is intrinsically inquisitive. You, science is never done looking at things. There's always another hypothesis that can be offered if it can be justified. So just as we became truthers, when we began to question official narratives, the Bible changes has pushed a lot of us into questioning official church narratives. Would you agree with that statement? Here's a few that we're starting to question. One of them is the, the definition between scripture and word. And we're demanding a strict, uh, a more stricter treatment of terminologies. I saw in, in when I studied the uh, statements of faith of the denominations, one of the denominations said, the Bible is the word of God. That was their beginning of their statement of faith. Mm. Well, no, if you want to be strict, and this is not splitting doctrinal hairs, this is just, you know, being uh discerning the bible is actually a compilation of books made up of what what's called the scripture so the bible is the is the uh the embodiment of the scriptures and this then the scriptures contain this is how i say it the con the scriptures contain the words of god by calling the bible the word of god you're, uh, you're overstating what it really is. You guys have any insight on that? Any thoughts? 
I think that if you look at it from a broad perspective, we, as a people, and I'm talking about everybody, not just Christians, we are such a people of platitudes. You know, you mentioned science. You talk about, you know, ball earth versus flat earth. Well, science proves that, but they never yeah. actually talk about what science is. They just state the platitude. Or we talk about the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve and they say, well, that's been debunked, but they never actually say how it's yeah, been debunked. Right. They state a platitude. And we know that the modern day cr Christian church has uh, really become adopted the world's ways. So are we really surprised that the modern day church uses the same platitudes in, 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 in similar ways that the world does? Firestarter says, I was always taught the words of God is in the book, not that the book was the word of God. Right. These are these are important distinctions. And we've had to go back and take another look at the doctrine of preservation. We've had to take a, another look at the preservation promises, which when we looked at them, we found that they weren't uh, really saying what we've been told they were saying. And I cover that in detail in chapter five of my book. Uh, we've had to re-examine the canon. Who are these people that put these books together and gave it to us as the final work? And why is books like uh, um, Enoch not in there? And we have questions. And by the way, so did the Bereans, and the Bible calls them noble. Uh, the role of Scripture in the life of the believer is at question. We feel that the role of Scripture has probably been overemphasized. That's right. That's right. You Pharisees displayed that in spades. The Pharisees displayed an overemphasis on the word, and they were out of balance. Jesus said, you tithe mint and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier things. Mm. So they had a balance problem, and the church has a balance problem when it comes to the word, the word, the word, the word. You need to be in the word. The foundation of our faith is the word. God doesn't speak to us anymore except through the word. That's what we're told. Of course, we are all questioning the legitimacy of the, con of the congregational format the, the church on the corner, and of the perils of the 501c3, and my favorite, the miracle-free intellectual gospel. I mean, many, many church leaders aren't even in, in they aren't even discerning, they're not vexed over the lack of demonstration. They're not even questioning that there should be. In other words, if you read revivals, the history of revivals, what typically happens is that one, two, three people or a bunch of people, they get fed up. It's basically what happens. They get to the point where they say, this is not right, okay? Uh, there should be healing and deliverances taking place. We want more, God. And they go into a room and they tell God, either we're going to die in this room or you're going to come down and touch us. So, so this is the plight of the body of Christ, is that we're not even doing that. We're not even uh, concerned that, that people aren't getting healed on a regular basis. So we're just accepting this different path of intellectualism and theology and debates and taking things in context and exegeting it properly and the definite root meanings and the concordance and all of this intricacies of knowledge but we're not talking to our people let's say you're a pastor you're not you're not um inspiring your people to fill their oil, lamps with oil or have the fire of god on them or have you have you heard from god have you getting a word from the lord they're almost discouraged from hearing god's voice that's common People that hear God's voice. I'm a little concerned about them. Have you guys heard that kind I've of comments? Yeah. It's a good word. And I, you know, I got a couple emails. I, I wanted to ask permission to use them, uh, but I, I didn't get a chance to. <clears throat> but, you know, they were basically my life 
I get these emails and the people are like, you know, my kids don't talk to me. My spouse divorced me. I haven't talked to anybody. I'm alone in the world. You're the only person I've ever talked to. Can I talk to you? Um, this is what's going on with the Christian truther. And you can't go back. You're, you're sort of in a really tough spot because, you know, integrity demands that you can't lie to yourself for the rest of your life. I mean, you can try to accommodate the people around you by being quiet and not pushing your stuff on them. I get that. But, you know, at a certain point, you're so um, alienated from them that it's almost worse than just um, being yourself. You, you're forced to live a lie. I, I called it happy dad. That's what I called it. Nothing negative or controversial, only happy things. And, you know, but you're still cut off. See, what I found after I was silent for two years, I was happy dad for two years. It didn't matter. I was still a marked man. I was a kook. And, uh, you know, they turn their backs on you, they love the world, and suddenly you don't. That's really the problem is you change overnight. You were just like them. And then all of a sudden, you saw NASA's fake, 9-11's fake, chemtrails are real, all this stuff. And you're like, ah, you're like freaking out. And they're not. And then you try to get them to see and they don't want to see. And then they tell you that, that you, they don't want you to see. And you're like, what am I going to do? You know, it's a horrible thing. So you sort of check out internally. And my, my wife would tell me that I was having an adulterous affair with what she called my information. And I can understand, all right, because you're suddenly engulfed in, in learning all this stuff, just consuming one new, unbelievable, mind-blowing thing after another, and they're watching you go down what they call the rabbit hole into madness. Now you're actually you're actually escaping madness, but they see you as falling into madness, right? And so it's actually the opposite because what the Bible says is friendship with the world is enmity towards God. It talks mm -hmm. about spiritual adultery. So that's what they're engaged in. And uh, you're coming out of that love of the world. And uh, they feel neglected and forgotten. But when a normie converts to trutherism, it's, it's a very transformative event. The truther, it's like you've seen a ghost. You ever heard that term? Hey, you look like you've seen a ghost. That's us. You, you've been smacked in the head with a two by four of truth. And it's like you've been born again again. It's a second born again experience. You're born again from hell to heaven, and then you're born again from being in the matrix to outside the matrix. And it's equally as volatile. So here's a, here's a couple of scriptures um, that illustrate this experience. Uh, give me one second. They are Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they agree? Hmm. What does light have to do with dark? That's what the Bible says. And then in Second uh, Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone. That's you. That's you, truther. You are alone and you're in a room with people and you're alone. In Matthew 18, again, I say unto you that if the two shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done. So agreement flees from you. If you're married to a normie, you're in an agreement vacuum. They don't know what you know and they don't want to know and then you're put in the box and you have to live in that box or else you sacrifice your happiness. First Corinthians one, I beseech you brethren by the name of the Lord that you all speak the same thing. 
that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. So these are all, you know, through the Bible, these concepts of unity and believing the same way. Uh, the Bible warns us not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Mm. So a person that's a truther, a Christian truther, and they're, you're married to just a Christian, you, in one sense, you're not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. But in another way, you are. Would that would you agree with that, Mark and and JC? That if your person, if you're married to a normie, a full blown thirty third degree normie, that they're you're unequally yoked. I would say yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. I know. I've been told, not with my wife, thankfully, because I wouldn't consider her a normie. But I've been told that I have to speak about these things in a nicer tone. Mm -hmm. only to speak about them in a nicer tone and to make people ha be even more angry with, with me than when I spoke about in an emphatic <laughs> tone. You probably had that experience, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually had that in my notes to take a poll, which is, th this was the poll I wanted to take. How many of you have been told it's not what you believe, it's your attitude about it? <laughs> Have you ever had that thrown up at you, JC, by any chance? I have not. I, okay. I felt like, because I'm, I'm a pretty laid back, mellow guy. I have a feeling it's what I'm saying and what I believe, not how I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. But Mark, you're, you're saying you've had that lecture? Oh, yeah. I've had that lecture. And then I've actually had the experience of, of like having to tape record myself or having to videotape myself <laughs> to prove yes. and, and, and really to, I've actually, okay, I'm only going to talk like this when I have this yeah. conversation. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go one octave above. So there's no way they can accuse me of it afterward. Only again, to have them be even more. Oh angry. my gosh. I can't believe you're saying this. I actually thought of that many times. <laughs> of recording myself so that I could show that I wasn't angry. They're the ones that go off flying up the handle. Like there was one time where I was sitting with my wife. At, we had this breakfast nook overlooking the side yard there. It's beautiful. And I'm, I'm sipping coffee. I forget what I brought up. It was something controversial. And I can't remember exactly what she said, but she essentially was like, well, why are you so upset about it? And I remember being so purposely careful not to sound upset, where I just said it so calmly and then, but that's how it's perceived. Or it's worse than that. It's almost like a defense mechanism mm. that they accuse you of being upset, even though you're not, so that you can then have a character flaw you can be marked by a character flaw, and then you're disqualified. I call it self-censoring. It's a way of attacking the messenger to underline the message. Yes. I'm telling you. It's also called projection. They project yep. their own anger and insecurities sure. onto you. This is really tough. And I know if you're listening to me, you're just nodding and bobbing. And, you know, there's a linear scale of how horrible it's been. And it depends on how outspoken you are. Like for me, it was really bad because I'm a content creator. So that's like, to them, that's me rubbing it in their face. Or that's me offending them even more. Because in their mind, this is how they think. Not just my family, but on any kind of normie. They, they don't believe the things that you believe are true. Keep that in mind, all right? They don't believe these things are true. Well, therefore, there's no importance to it. However, you have invested all of this energy and time into these things away from them, away from doing the landscaping, away from spending quality time with them. And then, and, and you're, you're emotionally unavailable. And all of these types of perceptions of you with things that aren't even real. So then 
that's an offense and a hurt that comes on on the on into the relationship and you you're powerless to take that away from them because you can't convince them it's it is true because that would change their perspective and you can't recant so it's just lingering out there like a bad smell <laughs> it's just it's intangible there's no answers for you you poor thing isn't it so similar to getting saved though? Because you, you mentioned your old friends. I think I told you I had my old college friends, uh, you know, recently just completely basically uh, ostracize me and never want to talk to me again. But what mm -hmm. it is, is they have these priorities of their life. You know, maybe it's partying or drinking or, you know, going on this vacation and, mm. and, and now, our priorities are the Lord Jesus Christ. It's same thing with the normie. Their normie, you know, th their priorities are the landscaping or cleaning the house or or whatever the case may be. And our priorities are the truth. Right. You do. You shift priorities overnight. That that became apparent to me. And you also have an injection of urgency into what you believe, because a lot of what we traffic in is bad news and it's danger. Will Robinson. Fauci's trying to kill us. They're spraying. I saw this video today on in-depth analysis of chemtrails, and it's 10 times worse than I thought. What's coming down from heaven all day long is killing us. It's terraforming the earth. It's getting ready to project holograms up there. Um, it's giving people more gelins. I don't know if you ever researched more gelins. They're like they're like uh, uh, nanotech worms that start coming out of your skin. And they looked at them under a microscope and they had perfect squares with a letter, like a Roman numeral in the middle of the square on the worm. So you wake up to this sci-fi horror movie and you're out doing lands. I remember this. I'm out doing landscaping on the Saturday morning with my family, trying to be happy, Dad. And I'm looking up and it's not just one or two trails in the sky there's like 15 of them crisscrossing like then i'm like ah this is this is like a horror movie and you can't say anything though you just have to suck it up and just boop, 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 boop. i need another bale of pine needles please <laughs> and it's like i can't live like this rome is burning isn't that what they say about Caesar? He was he was dithering while Rome was burning. So the truther doesn't let go of of this world with, without a lot of pain. It's not easy to depart from the matrix. There's like there's astonishment, there's fear, but and this is for all of you listening. Congratulations. God is proud of you. You did the right thing. I am here to commend you. I'm here to validate your perceptions. You did it. You have integrity. That's why you are a truther. And you have humility. And God is pleased with you. And the fact that there's a trail of dead bodies behind you is actually an indication that you're on the right path. Jesus said, take heed when all men speak well of you. He also said, if he that loves mother and father blah 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 more than me it's not worthy of me hey jesus i want to follow you but my, i have to bury my father so this guy's father was on his deathbed and then jesus comes through town and preaches a barn burner and the guy wants to follow him and then he says i'm going to follow you but i just got to hang around but until my dad dies i got to respect my dad well and this is what jesus says let the dead bury the dead So, you follow the truth, truther, wherever it takes you. Because you can only please God or man. you got to pick one. And I don't have to stand before my wife or my children when I take my last breath. So, we go where the truth leads us. That's the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is you just do it. And, uh, but I'm not advocating you blow up your family. I really feel that we need to go the extra mile. We need to just be quiet, meet their demands, 
But be prepared because you're going to have to live in a sort of bizarre silence for an extended period of time, which is gut-wrenching. It's a siege of self-deprecation and self-flagellation, and it is an ongoing violent violation of your integrity and your conscience to stay silent on, on, while Rome is burning. And it makes you feel dirty, uh, as though you've been forced to sell your body for sex. You are coerced and threatened into forced labor. That's what it feels like. You're, you're basically feeling like you're selling your soul for a crumb of worldly happiness. I called it, I called it begging for crumbs of respect. Oh, I'll be your puppet. I'll be your trained seal if you'll just be nice to me. Don't reject me. I'll, I won't say anything that offends you. I'll believe all the things you believe. I'll pretend I'm deceived just like you are. Just don't be mean to me. Clawing your way through every day, living in the same house with people who are bound, in many cases, by a solemn oath of marriage to you or by blood. You bring children into the world, but you grow, you look at them over time with a growing sense of disdain and distrust as they do to you. It's inexorable. You can't avoid it. You're in two different worlds. That's what my wife told me when I was on my knees begging her not to break up our family on the back patio. On my knees begging her. And she said, I don't want to be married to you We're in two different worlds. But I got an email from someone who confided and she she I she said I could use the testimony. She had come to the breaking point. And many of you have reached that point where you're forced to basically be like, you know what, sayonara, I'm not leaving this marriage. But if you're going to place ultimatums on me, it's a deal breaker. And what I started telling my wife is I started saying, honey, I got off the bus. I can't, I can't do life like, you know, I can't clap for NASA. I can't believe in the voting thing. I can't believe in the tax scheme. I can't believe in the cops imperious behavior when they're actually employees of a privately held for profit business and they have no jurisdiction over me. All of that is looked upon as though you've gone rogue. You don't love the America anymore because you found out it's a corporate fraud. Then the gold fringe around the flag tells you that you're under military military admiralty law and it's just a nightmare scenario. And then Fauci comes along and they want to put you in a COVID camp. Well, that's absolute nonsense. And all this stuff is now being proven to be real. And I don't know what they're going to do. My wife still to this moment has no idea what happened, nor do my children. They have no idea what really happened with their family. And they believe mommy was justified in sending daddy packing because daddy was a nut job and daddy chose his information over us. So we're offended. Daddy was angry. And it wasn't what daddy believed. It was his attitude about it. But neither my wife nor my children are in touch with their own avarice, their own disrespect, their own willful ignorance and their own cognitive dissonance. And I do take responsibility where my children are concerned. They really are innocent. They're blameless. They're, they were very young when this all started taking place. And I could have been a much better at handling the searing rejection, I'm sure. Uh, but it was the fireworks between my wife and I that made so much bad blood. And of course, my children were forced to take a side. So what's the likelihood that they're going to side with the kook? They're not going to go with the kook. But what I know to be true is that it is the attitude of the normie that is abominable. The truth there might talk too much and may be obsessed and may not handle the searing rejection with poise and love and humility. But we aren't the ones issuing the relationship ending ultimatums. 
I've proven that to be true. If you don't stop talking about your crazy things, I can't have a relationship with you, ends the relationship. When they tell you that, they are ending it right at that moment, if, whether you continue to be silent or not. So we have a duty to the truth, but Christians are not Christian truthers. And they don't have a duty to the truth somehow. I don't know how they continue to have a relationship with the truth because they have a death to truth or algorithm instead. And Christians, and especially Christian leaders, will treat you with such harsh, irrational behavior. If you bring up conspiracies, it'll make your head spin. So that's our journey. I hope it helps you to know that you're not alone. <laughs> that's really the only comfort that we can offer. <laughs> The only comfort that we have is you're not alone and you'll have to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. That's it. We, this is our support group here. We come together. My name is John. I'm a conspiracy theorist. And then you guys are supposed to say, hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> So that's affirming. See, that's why they do that in AA. They tell you, you know, you admit you're an alcoholic and then everybody says hi, meaning you're not rejected, even though you're not perfect. Hi, John. Thank you, Mark. I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so for all of you listening, we're glad you're here and you're not crazy. All right. The sane... The crazy people are calling the sane people crazy. That's what's happening. That's you. You're the sane ones. And a hundred reasonable men would agree. <clears throat> and it's all going to be uh, interesting in the next six to 12 months as all this stuff comes out in the open like it is now. And I think we're going to experience a good amount of vindication. Hmm. So buckle your seatbelts. I think things are about to get real bumpy. What do you guys think? I absolutely think so. Yeah. You want to just talk on that for a minute before we close out? Well, all of these things that have been building for years, I think, are coming to a head. And between talk of World War III, Civil War, mm -hmm. looks like we're going to have martial law with... Uh, potentially the, the attempt to uh, deport illegal immigrants. We've got the alien disclosure. We've got the blackouts and the, the uh, cyber attacks. Um, following this guy on X who is an earthquake researcher and he's convinced that we're due for a absolutely world destroying earthquake Mm -hmm. which will trigger tsunamis. You've got all these things going on that, to me, I just, uh, you know, I'm sure I could be wrong, and I try to remind myself that, but it feels like things are coming to a head, and something big is going to happen. I agree. <clears throat> That's just Bobby a short Stan. list, too. What you just shared is a short list. There, There's so many other things that are catastrophic, the food chain disruptions. Mm -hmm. uh, world War Three seems, you know, we're in World War Three right now. It just hasn't spread, but we are officially because the United Kingdom l launched missiles as well. So once two countries attack one country, that's f that is war. And that's happened. And now Biden just said he's sending tanks, which 10 months ago, Biden said, if we send tanks, then we're at war. Well, he just sent tanks. So they're trying to push World War III before Trump gets in, if there is actually a battle, or that's the plan, to create World War III for Trump, so when he gets in, he'll be able to implement martial law and then sweep, us, sweep all the detractors into the COVID camps. We'll see if we're still here in 12 months. Mark, you were going to say something? 
I'm just going to say one more quick word and then I got to sign off. Yep. Um, wow. You know, thank you for having me. Thank you, JC. I, I just agree with so, there's so much power and agreement and I agree mm-hmm. with so much of what was said here tonight. I mean, the last thing I want to say about the Mandela effect and, and every conspiracy really, you know, God says, if you, if you seek after, if you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. And here's what I've learned in this experience. The enemy cannot touch that. Nobody can take that away from us. It doesn't matter if the Bible's changing. It doesn't matter if the world is ending. It doesn't matter if we have World War III. It doesn't matter if our families and friends desert us. Mm-hmm. The Bible says, if, if, you're, if your father and mother desert you, I will take you up. One of my favorite verses. So I think just be encouraged and I, I appreciate so much the chat and, you know, some of the things people have sent me, it's just a bit of a wild ride and a great experience. Amen. JC is definitely one of us. That's what sticks quoted there in the, <laughs> in the chat. So we appreciate you too, JC. Thank you. And, I uh, guess. <laughs> yeah. You're one of us. <laughs> it's all good, man. We're, we're just, uh, we're just all trying to get a, a read on on uh, what this is happening in this crazy world and but we have a mission and that's our that's our uh, marching orders is to reach out to the church at large with the story of the bible changing and that's going to start happening in the next couple of weeks so we'll be we'll be watching that as we roll this out it's going to be exciting and we're going to start to see some fireworks on that front so God bless everybody. Thanks for listening. Appreciate every one of you. And uh, Mark and JC, thank you for joining me. It was really great to have you guys with me. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mark. Okay, guys. God bless. Take care, everybody.